as we sit here testifying, the President is attacking you on Twitter. Um, and I'd like to give you a chance to respond. I'll read part of one of his tweets. Everywhere Marie Ivanovich went turned bad. She started off in Somalia. How did that go? Uh, he goes on to say, uh, later in the tweet, is a U.S. President's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. First of all, uh, Ambassador Ivanovich, the Senate has a chance to confirm or deny an ambassador, do they not? Yes, advise and consent. But would you like to respond to the President's attack that everywhere you went turned bad? Well, I, I mean, I don't... I don't think I have such powers, uh, not in Mogadishu, Somalia, Somalia, and not in other places. I actually think that um, where I've served over the years, um, I and others have demonstrably um, made things better, you know, for the U.S. as well as for the countries uh, that I've served in. Uh, Ukraine, for example, where there are huge challenges, including, you know, on the issue that we're discussing today of, of corruption huge challenges, but they've made a lot of progress since 2014, including in the years that I was there. And I think in part, uh, I mean, the Ukrainian people get the most, um, the most credit for that, but a part of that credit goes to the work of the United States and, um, and to me as the ambassador in, in, the United, um, in Ukraine. Ambassador, um, you've shown the courage to come forward today and testify notwithstanding the fact you were urged by the White House or State Department not to, notwithstanding the fact that, as you testified earlier, the President implicitly threatened you in that call record, and now the President in real time is attacking you. What effect do you think that has on other witnesses' willingness to come forward and expose wrongdoing? Well, uh, it's very intimidating. It's a dime designed to intimidate, is it not? I, I mean, I can't speak to what the president is trying to do, but I think the effect is to be intimidating. Well, I want to let you know, Ambassador, that some of us here take witness intimidation very, very seriously. What we saw today is it wasn't enough that Ambassador Ivanovich was smeared, it wasn't enough that she was attacked, it wasn't enough that she was recalled for no reason, at least no good reason, um, but we saw today witness intimidation in real time by the President of the United States. But once again, going after this dedicated and respected career public servant uh, in an effort to not only chill her, but to chill others uh, who may come forward. Um, we take this kind of witness intimidation and obstruction of inquiry very seriously. Do you think that's a peaceful... uh, I know, Ms. Stefanik, you had a, a few quick questions for the ambassador. I'll yield to you, Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. Ambassador Yovanovitch, thank you for being the here today. Suspend. The gentlewoman will suspend. What is the interruption for this time? It is our time. The gentlewoman will suspend. You're not recognized. Mr. Nunez, you are minority I counsel. Just, I just recognized. Under Mr. the Trump. House Resolution 660, you're not allowed to yield time except to minority counsel. The ranking member you're, yielded time to another member of Congress. Nope. That is not accurate. You're gagging the that young is lady accurate. from New York. Ambassador Yovanovitch, I want to thank you for being here today. The gentlewoman will suspend. You're not recognized. This is the fifth time you have interrupted members of Congress, duly elected members of Congress. The woman will suspend. Uh, Mr. Chair, we, we control the time. Uh, it's been customary to this committee that whoever controls the time uh, can yield to whoever they wish. If we have members of Congress that have a few questions, it seems appropriate that we'd be able to let Ms. Stefanik uh, ask her question. Mr. Nunez, you or Minority Counsel recognized. Frankly, you're the best of this nation. And I cannot think of anybody else I would rather have representing us in a foreign capital than you. you. My colleagues have gone to a great deal of effort to better understand the facts surrounding your removal. I think the facts are pretty clear. There was a smear campaign, and it was orchestrated by a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor, the president's attorney, the president's son, and even some of the president's allies at his favorite TV station. So that campaign led to your removal. Despite 33 years of outstanding service, progressive responsibility, 
and awards. And so I kind of sit here with a mix of emotions. On the one hand, I, there's some pride and gratitude for all your outstanding service. And on the other hand, I'm angry, like my friend from Connecticut. In fact, I'm very angry about how it is the most powerful person on the face of the earth would remove you from office after your stellar service and somehow feel compelled to characterize you as bad news and then to ominously threaten that you're going to go through some things. So I am angry, but I'm not surprised. After all, as was suggested earlier, he said the whistleblower may have committed treason, a crime punishable by death, even though the whistleblower strictly adhered to the letter of the law as independently attested to by both the Trump-appointed Inspector General and the acting DNI. After all, he even demeaned the memory of Senator McCain after he lied in his grave at the Naval Academy grounds despite a lifetime of public service and serving six years as a prisoner of war in a tiny cell in Hanoi being beaten and tortured every day. And after all, he belittled the Gold Star Khan family, whose son, Captain Khan, gave his last full measure of devotion out of love for this country. And let me tell you, as somebody whose older brother never saw his 35th birthday because of service in the Vietnam War, those words are deeply offensive. Words matter, and the words leveled against you constitute bullying of the worst order. Your good character, your outstanding reputation have been besmirched in a way that is devoid of common decency. But here's my message to you. There is nothing, Ambassador Ivanovich, nothing he can say or do, not a thing, that will in any way diminish the nature and quality of the service you have rendered to our great nation. Not a thing. And there is not a thing he can say or do that will diminish our gratitude to you for that service. And I thank you again for it. Thank you. Thank you. So as to the larger point, I, I would like you to answer what does this mean to Ukraine when the United States actually engages in the kind of behavior that we are attempting to discourage them from engaging in, namely a politically motivated prosecution? What does that mean to our what does that mean to them in their struggling efforts to become a robust democracy? What's the impact in Ukraine for this behavior? I think Ukraine, like many countries, looks to us for the power of our example. And um, I think that when we um, engage in questionable uh, activities, uh, that, that raises a question. And um, it, it, it emboldens those who are corrupt, who don't want to see Ukraine become um, you know, a democracy, a free market economy, a part of Europe, but want Ukraine to stay in, um, you know, under Russia's thrall. And that's not in our national security interests. Thank you, Ambassador Ivanovich. Thank you so very much. Welcome, as I said last, uh, a couple of days ago to the witnesses, welcome to year four of the impeachment proceedings. I'm sorry that you've gotten drugged into this. For three years, we've heard these outrageous and, frankly, unbelievable accusations regarding Russian collusion, uh, accusations that we now are, know are absolute nonsense. There was no basis at all, despite promises from some members of this committee that they had secret proof that would prove this collusion, and again, we know that it was nonsense. But now in year four, we apparently move on to Ukraine and quid pro quo, culminating yesterday when the speaker announced that the president would indeed be impeached and removed for office for bribery. And with that uh, statement, I would now feel compelled to ask you, Madam Ambassador, as, as you sit here before us, very simply and directly, do you have any information regarding the president of the United States accepting any bribes? No. 
Do you have any information regarding any criminal activity that the President of the United States has been involved with at all? No. Thank you. Thank you for answering that directly. The American people know this is nonsense. The American people know this is unfair. And I have a prediction regarding this. I think that public support for impeachment is actually going to be less when these hearings are over than it is when the hearings began. Because finally, the American people are going to be able to see the evidence. And they're going to be able to make their own determination regarding that. Now, I want to ask you one thing very quickly, and you've been asked this again and again, but my question is slightly different. You've been asked, as you recognize, that the president, any president, has the ability to ask his ambassadors to serve at will. I'm curious, do you think that's the right policy? Yeah, I probably think it is. I, I do as well. It may be imperfect. There may be times when it's not used perfectly, but I agree with you. It is the right policy. I don't think that we should change that. Now, I'd like to read from some previous statements, including one of your own, as well as others, regarding the appropriateness of investigating corruption in the UK. From Ms. Fiona Hill. So again, the fact that there are investigations into corruption in the energy sector in Ukraine, as well as Russia and many other countries, is not a surprise. From yourself, your previous testimony question, was it the general understanding that Burisma was a company that suffered from allegations of corruption? Your answer was yes. From Ambassador Sondland, I, am, I just am generally aware that Burisma is considered a potentially corrupt company. Would you agree then that it's appropriate to investigate corruption? I think it's appropriate if it's, um, if it's part of our um, national uh, strategy. Um, what I would say is that we have um, a process for doing that. It's called the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. We have one with Ukraine. And generally, it goes from, the, from our Department of Justice to the Ministry of Justice in the country of interest. Okay, and, and that's I, the usual path. And I appreciate that. Regardless of the process, though, it's appropriate for us to investigate in, in potential corruption. And especially, look, we're, we're about to give these, uh, some of these countries hundreds of millions of dollars. That the U.S. taxpayer said, here's a dollar of mine, go ahead and give it to this other country. But please only do it if you know it's not going to be used for corrupt purposes or against our national interest. And, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, because I promised my friend, Mr. Jordan, I would save him a little bit of time. We mentioned earlier, the vice president, when he was, went to the Ukraine and called for the specific firing of a specific prosecutor, that he was, as they say, completing official U.S. policy. But the interesting thing is this. The vice president had exactly two countries that were his responsibility at that time, China and the Ukraine. And he has bragged and been very proud of his influence in the previous administration. He says again and again, that the Obama administration listened to him, so it doesn't surprise me that they would be fulfilling a policy that this vice president certainly helped to formulate. Today we've seen you as this former ambassador, this 33-year veteran of the Foreign Service, but I want to know about you personally and how this has affected you personally and your family. Yeah, It's been a difficult time. I mean, I... Uh... I'm a private person, I don't want to put all that out there, but it's been a very, very difficult time because um, the president does have the right to have his own uh, or her own ambassador in every country in the world. But, does, it, but does the president have the right to actually malign people's character? I mean, it may not be against any law, but I would think that it would be against decorum and decency. I mean, there's a question as to why the kind of campaign to get me out of Ukraine happened. Um, because all the president has to do is say he wants a different ambassador. And in my line of work, um, perhaps in your line of work as well, all we have is our reputation. And so this has been a very painful period. I'm asking... Time for the gentleman's expired, but I'll allow you to, to repeat the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm asking, you might, you might, maybe we can kind of see why the president was a little concerned when you have the highest ranking officials in the government, the ambassador criticizing him, parliamentary member Lashenko criticizing him, when you have Avakov, the guy who first told you about Giuliani, criticizing him, 
All this going on, and when you couple that with the concerns he has about corruption, the concerns he has about Europe not doing enough, the concerns he has about reluctance to send in the hard-earned tax dollars to any country, Jordan, frankly. I have indulged you with extra time, but I appreciate I, my it. indulgence is wearing out. I appreciate it. Uh, there is a question our, here, right? Our indulgence wore out with you a long time ago, Mr. Chairman. Well, I I'll tell I, you that. I'm about to gavel you down, so if you have a question, well, I suggest you... you I'm asking it. her, is, is, do you think there's maybe a reason that, this was, that, that, that President Trump's concern was justified? You know, I, I can't speak for the President on this, um, but what I would say is um, you've listed a number of actions. I, I think from my point of view, uh, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't create a Ukrainian government strategy uh, to interfere in our election. I didn't say that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, please allow the ambassador to answer the question. So I, I would just say that, um, you know, U.S. politicians will often <laughs> criticize policies of uh, foreign, uh, foreign counterparts, even perhaps during their elections. Uh, you know, this, this happens in politics, and I think that it, it doesn't necessarily constitute interference. Would you ever write an op-ed critical of a presidential Jordan, candidate in Ukraine? Jordan, your time has expired. Mr. Welch, you're recognized. Thank you. I will just uh, emphasize once again about the importance of your testimony. Mr. Kent and Ambassador Taylor gave us the broad outlines of this story. This is a story about an effort to coerce, condition, or bribe a foreign country into doing the dirty work of the president, investigations of his political rival, by conditioning U.S. taxpayer money, by conditioning a meeting that President Zelensky desperately wanted and needed to establish that relationship with the most powerful patron of Ukraine, the United States of America. The fact that they failed in this solicitation of bribery doesn't make it any less bribery, doesn't make it any less immoral or corrupt. It just means it was unsuccessful. And to that we owe other dedicated public servants who blew the whistle. Had they not blown the whistle, we wouldn't be here. And I think it is appalling that my colleagues continue to want to out this whistleblower so that he or she can be punished by this president. But let's underscore once again, while you are the beginning of this story, you're not the end of it, but nonetheless the beginning is important because the beginning of the story is an effort to get you out of the way, an effort by Rudy Giuliani and Fruman and Parnas and corrupt Ukrainians like Lutsenko to get you out of the way because they felt you were an impediment to these political investigations the president so desperately wanted. Giuliani has made it abundantly clear he was in Ukraine on a mission for his client, for the president, to investigate the Bidens. And you were viewed as an obstacle that had to go, not just by Giuliani, but by the president of the United States. And if people had any doubt about it, they should do what the president asks, read the transcript. And what they'll see in that transcript is the president praises the corrupt. He praises the corrupt, Lutsenko. He condemns the just, you. And then he asks for an investigation of the Bidens. There is no camouflaging that corrupt intent. We are adjourned. Mr. Speaker, our speaker in condition. Mr. Please Chairman, allow the witness to Mr. Leave. Chairman, you disparage, you disparage those members on this side of the aisle. We should have a chance to respond to your disparaging remarks. Mr. Chairman, I demand or seek. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman.